So let's give it up for George. I'm really happy to have this opportunity to be with you today. And as Peter said, the, uh, one, one of the things that I'm proudest of is the Global Nonviolent Action uh, Database because it's the first time that online, you can just go to your computer, just go online, just type in Global Nonviolent Action Database, and right there you've got 1,400 cases from all over the world, from almost 200 countries, of people like you, like me, people struggling for change. And in many of those cases, uh, the, their nonviolent direct action campaigns were successful, even against dictatorships. Military dictatorships have been overthrown by people's movements using nonviolent direct action. And there it is, you can just read about them. And we also, the, one of the hardest things for the students was I, I made them give a score of degree of success for every single campaign. So of course some com campaigns, you know, like one or two, it was a score of one to 10. So some got one or two, some got three or four or five, six, and there were some, a whole bunch who got eight, nine, and 10. And uh, that, you know, so it was a really rigorous database. I think you'd enjoy it. But as, as Peter says, this is a chance for you to hear something about my life. And so I do want to share with that. And, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Let's start out with that one. In June 1964, I joined the Freedom Summer training staff in Ohio for the first week's batch of nearly 500 volunteers. In Ohio, we, rely, we relied heavily on role plays, giving participants nonviolent combat training to orient them to the conflicts that they might encounter in Mississippi. The staff included a number of SNCC workers fresh from the field in Mississippi who shared sometimes brutally honest stories of violence and degrading jail conditions. The songs and group spirit in the jails buoyed them, however, and kept them in touch with their passion for justice. At the end of the week, I watched them excitedly board the buses headed for the south. Again, those SNCC workers, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee workers. After a day to debrief and relax, the training staff welcomed another batch of hundreds of student volunteers. This project was the idea of its coordinator, Bob Moses, a high school math teacher in New York who left his job to go to Mississippi and organize poor, illiterate, and rural black residents to register to vote. Bob believed that if close to a thousand mostly white young people from the north came to Mississippi to accompany the, the SNCC workers, the sheer danger of their exposure, of these northern students' exposure, would activate their parents and their communities. He envisioned those folks compelling a reluctant Democratic administration in Washington to intervene and force Mississippi to desegregate. On the second day of the second week, we were all called to the college auditorium. The students from the first week were already distributed around Mississippi. I found a seat in the second row of the auditorium along with others on the training staff, guessing we would get a progress report. But when a federal official who'd been observing the training came to the center of the stage, he appeared upset. He looked around, then stared at the paper he had placed on the rostrum. We've just received word that three of the Freedom Summer workers are missing together in Mississippi. James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner. Cheney was a SNCC field organizer. Goodman and Schwerner were student volunteers. I was stunned. Cheney, along with other SNCC organizers, had been at high risk for months, I knew. But Goodman and Schwerner had been here in our training the previous week. Volunteers, like the students standing, sit, sitting around me. And those guys might already be dead? Looking around, I wondered what the students were imagining. How many of them would quickly return to the northern suburban homes that many of them had come from? 
over the next few days, in addition to our training, I watched the SNCC workers take on the role of older siblings to these frightened students. We built an invincible container strong enough to hold the shock and grief and fear that rocked our training. Under the old trees of the campus, stories and listening, freedom songs and prayers were shared. Very few students went home. At the end of the training, most got on the buses and took their turn to head toward Mississippi. SNCC's 1964 campaign turned out to be one of the boldest and most brilliant strategic moves of the entire civil rights movement with lessons for today. Their primary target was the federal government led by a democratic administration that was highly reluctant to support racial integration in the South. The SNCC joined Bayard Rustin, Dr. King, and others in believing that federal pressure was needed to force change. And it worked. Thank you. Fast forward, I have an eight-year-old son named Peter, six-year-old, six-year-old. I found myself wanting six-year-old Peter to try his hand at activism, but <laughs> our bomber campaign wouldn't be the right place to start. That's the campaign I was involved with then, stop being the B-1 bomber campaign. I didn't think that was a place for a six-year-old. So some members of my activist group at that time were helping out in the growing consumer boycotts of grapes and lettuce that had been called by the United Farm Workers of America, in the, the, the farm workers in California, actually. And they told me they were going to start picketing at our local neighborhood supermarket. I explained to Peter that the aim of the boycott was to improve the lives of children like himself. He immediately volunteered for the picket line. After standing with the rest of us holding his sign while people went in and out of the store, he got a little bored. He handed his sign to me and moved up the sidewalk about 15 feet from the supermarket door to meet people who were coming to shop. He walked up to somebody and said, don't go in there and buy that scabbage lettuce. <laughs> I guess Peter had heard us talking about scabs, strike breakers who were being hired by the employer. I saw the shopper hesitate while looking at my boy. With a look of puzzlement on her face, she then continued walking toward the door. Peter, cute as anything, with a head full of curls and a determined look, backed up in front of her as she kept walking saying in his biggest voice, don't you buy that scabbage lettuce. She kept walking, and Peter kept backing up in front of her until he backed right through the doorway and into the store. He disappeared from sight for a minute, then came out of the store and walked down the sidewalk to find another shopper to confront. He did the same thing again, walking backward in front of them while saying with a loud little boy's voice, don't you buy that scabbage lettuce. The third time he did not he did that, he didn't come right out of the store. And I started to think I'd better go in and see what was happening inside. But hardly a minute later, the store manager came outside pulling Peter by the hand. The manager looked mad. Whose boy is this, he demanded. I raised my hand proudly. He's mine. <laughs> the United Farm Workers won that boycott, increased wages and benefits for its workers, and gained recognition as a union. Years later, when I ended up leading some nonviolent workshops with Cesar Chavez, who was the founder and director of that union, I couldn't resist telling him the scabbage story. And I'll never forget his appreciative grin. <laughs> <laughs> During my years teaching at Swarthmore College, I noticed that there was a circle of students who took several courses with me 
and then also went with me to Appalachia when I filled the college van with students wanting to investigate the impact of mountaintop removal coal mining. I seemed to be looked to for mentoring. Swatties, that's what they called themselves, Swatties. Swatties then joined other college students in demonstrations organized by my group, Earthquaker Action Team, or a group we, we called Equate, the new environmental group that I had initiated in 2009. We pronounced our group's initials as Equate because it made it fun and easy to say and remember. The shorthand also had a pleasant resonance for us oldsters who remembered a 1960s Quaker group that we had organized called A Quaker Action Group, AQUAG. I especially love that name, by the way, because I, we were going up against the federal government very hard, and we could picture the feds padlocking our doors. So then we figured, okay, well, we're a Quaker Action Group, but they're shutting us down. So let's then go across the street and start B Quaker Action Group. <laughs> and then if that happens again, you get the idea. I think the feds would give, give up after a while. History was generating increased attention to climate change by the time I'm reading this part, the, my Swarthmore College days, and I was eager to dance with it. So were other Quakers who collectively sensed a calling to do more. The existing ecology of Quaker organizations working on climate had an empty niche available for a direct action-oriented rebel-style organization, the role that this new group would fill. Even though I had asserted decades earlier that environment would become a key arena for struggle for a just world, I had focused on other issues in my own activism. Now, I was ready to mentor those who were new to direct action, Quakers or Swarthmore students, in a dynamic campaign to force the seventh largest bank in the United States, PNC Bank, to give up its practice of financing mountaintop removal coal mining in Appalachia. PNC was the number one financier of that devastating assault on the earth and the people of Appalachia. It was a long shot, but I reckoned we had a chance. The PNC Bank near the White House was our choice for our first civil disobedience action, and two Swarthmore students joined the dozen and a half activists ready to be that bold. The bank was nicknamed the President's Bank, that particular bank in Washington, because so many White House occupants over the years did their personal banking there. The walls were covered with oil paintings of presidents and other eminent depositors of yesterday. So we went into the bank along with other tourists and looked at the paintings before gathering in the center of the lobby to form a circle. We sang movement songs and took turns praying and singing. I was afraid the bank manager was going to have a heart attack, shrieking, get out of here, get out of here before remembering to call the police. <laughs> the students looked worried, too. The manager hustled other customers out of the bank, sent the tellers home, and locked the door. One of our Equate members had been assigned to talk down the manager, but she had her hands full. None of us expected hysteria. The manager, by the way, later apologized to us. Another Equate member was assigned to door duty, which was a good thing because when the police came, our Equate member needed to unlock the locked door to let them in. <laughs> For, fortunately, before the police arrived, we had time to center ourselves, seated around a little hill of dirt we had created from the baggies that had been concealed in our, in our pockets. There was a little sign on the top that said, Save me. We even got to settle into some good moments of silent prayer. The police told our person at the door that they did not intend to arrest us because their system was clogged. This was because our action was planned to coincide with a much larger day of action in D.C. by thousands of people concerned about mountaintop removal coal mining, including many from Appalachia, of course. Eager for our action to unfold with the drama we had planned, our Equate member insisted that the police at least make some arrests. <laughs> Eventually, they agreed, the police agreed to take three of us and allowed us to decide who. 
in our circle, we quickly decided on a Swarthmore student, an activist from Chicago, and me. So began Equate's rebel activity that persisted for the five years it took to win. We undertook 125 actions and inspired customers to pool their deposits of $3.5 million. We marched 200 miles across Pennsylvania to PNC's headquarters in Pittsburgh. We learned to hold prey-ins. We, we shut down two of the shareholders' meetings. A typical Equate demonstration had an age range of 18 to 80, but sometimes we were able to include eager children. Haverford and Bryn Mawr students, uh, college students, also joined in to swell the college age contingent with the Swarthmore students. We started in 2009 with a group that fit in my living room, smaller than this group, and we grew steadily. By December 2014, we were able to conduct within 24 hours a total of 31 bank actions in 12 states and D.C. It became clear to PNC Bank that our group would, stop, would never stop growing <laughs> and would never go away until the bank changed its policy. In their announcement, they said that their change was, quote, driven by environmental and health concerns as well as our risk appetite. <laughs> After a growing number of the Swarthmore students um, joined Equate and learned how to do this kind of thing, they started to focus on their own college and demand that Swarthmore College give up its carbon uh, deposit type uh, stocks uh, in its own investment strategy, and then invited students from around the country to come to Swarthmore and launch a national divestment campaign, which happened. And then uh, when they graduated, they eventually had to, had to graduate. I mean, I wish I could have just convinced the other professors to flunk them until, you know, keep, keep them there. They were doing so well <laughs> at learning social change. The trouble is they were all brilliant and they were doing very well doing their other subjects too. So, uh, so finally, uh, they did graduate. So they went to my neighborhood, holed up in a house, and planned their next move. Guess what that was? The Sunrise Movement that we experience today, one of the most vital and uh, effective uh, environmental movements that we have today. I was so proud when they did that, and uh, so proud when the New York Times uh, made a big deal out of them and said, where did you learn this kind of thing? And they said, oh, <laughs> and they told the truth. When they did that, actually, um, the, the, my colleagues, the other professors at Swarthmore, said, George, your days are numbered. <laughs> because the board of the college is going to, uh, you know, take consequential action. And I said, well, we'll see. But I lasted for a few more years before retirement. So those are a few stories from here. What I also wanted to do, one reason why I like to read stories from these is not only because they're, they're fun for me to remember, but also because I figure whenever a book is on sale, it's good to know, is it a book that is kind of boring and I'll fall asleep on it, or will it be somewhat lively? So you make your own judgment. I don't see anybody asleep out there, so it looks pretty good. Um, but the other thing I wanted to share and then have group discussion about is my take on where we are today in relation to polarization in our country. Because oh, how many of you would say that you have, have been worried some about the degree of polarization, political polarization, people at odds with each other? Yeah. I was, because my training is sociology, I was noticing this and tracking it a dozen years ago. Sociologists can't help ourselves. We, every time we look at a social system, we're interested in how integrated is it you know, as compared with how much friction is there within it. We, we can't help noticing that whether it's a small social system like a family or whether it's as large as a nation. So I was tracking it and I was thinking, oh, this is very bad news um, because there's so much polarization going on. That was even a dozen years ago. Of course, now it's way, way bigger than that. And uh, so I was, I was feeling bad about that and on the other hand, pessimistic as a result of that. But on the other hand, it was also the moment when I was researching an earlier book of mine called Viking Economics. Any of you hear, ever hear about that book? Yeah, it's about Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Iceland. 
because I wanted to know not only how their economic system worked such that they were getting way superior results to the results that our economic system gets in terms of equality, in terms of individual freedom. They have much more individual freedom over there than we do. In terms of, of, of uh, social programs, in terms of education. They're just, in those ways, they're just way, way ahead of the United States. Well, I was curious not so much about how their, how, uh, what that quality of life was like. I do talk about that in the book. But I also was curious about how did they get there? Because 100 years ago, they were a mess. You probably know people who came here from Norway, whose ancestors came here from Norway, or from Sweden, or from Denmark in, in those days 100 years ago, because those countries were in terrible shape. And our country was way better off than their country was. And now, their countries are way, way, way ahead of us. So when did they make their shift? How did they move from inferior to us to superior to us? When did they make their leap? So I was investigating their history, which Scan writers about Scandinavia don't tend to touch. What I found was that they made their big leap forward at the very time when they were experiencing the greatest polarization in the modern age. I'm talking about the 1920s and 30s. Biggest polarization they had experienced in modern times. And yet, that's when they made their leap forward. That contradicts my assumptions about when, you know, how, how this works, how polarization works. So I was really, really puzzled about that. It was bothering me. And then I found a metaphor that really helped me come to terms with it. I was book touring in Britain. By then, my book, Viking Economics, had come out. The, it, it did very well in this country. And Forbes magazine, of all places, recently said it's one of the five best books on Scandinavia. And it was, and it was doing really well in, in Britain. So I was doing book tour. And one night, I was staying with a Quaker artist who had recently changed his art form uh, to, to working with metal. He was making these gorgeous metal sculptures, and I was wandering around his house looking at these beautiful things and turning it to him and saying, how do you make metal be so beautiful? The, my understanding of metal is it's very rigid. It's you know just the way it is and doesn't want to be any different. And the, uh, you get it to be so beautiful and curvaceous and whatever you want. How do you do that? And he said, oh, come on, George. I'll show you. Let's go. So I follow him out through the back, through the kitchen, into the backyard. Out there's a studio. We go into his studio. He opens the door and proudly presents his forge. He said, yeah, I had to apprentice to a blacksmith to find out how to work a forge. Because you're right, metal doesn't want to do what I want it to do. So I need to make it malleable. I need to make it soft so that I can work with it the way I want to work with it. Thank you, I said. You have given me such a breakthrough. That's a metaphor that I can use to understand polarization. How it can be that polarization can, on the one hand, be hot, <laughs> heating things up, right? And on the other hand, also make things malleable so that they can be changed. After all, that happened in my country in the 1930s which was a period of tremendous polarization. The Nazis filled Madison Square Garden in the 30s. The Communist Party, it was the, it was the glory period of the American Communist Party. Now, I would call that a difference. <laughs> and the tremendous lot of, of, of conflict going on, Ku Klux Klan bombing, Ku Klux Klan uh, lynching people, all of that was going on, and at that time, we made our greatest progress in the first half of the 20th century. And how about the 60s? How many of you were around in the 60s enough to uh, notice what was going on? Would you call that a kind of placid period, a kind of uh, ho-hum uh, politically? I wish our politics were a little more interesting. 
Whoa. I mean, I, I remember fights between teenagers and their parents over Vietnam, right? And, and what do you mean you want to go to Canada instead of fight for your country? Your dad fought for your country? And all of that going on. Tremendous fighting going on about Vietnam. But the, the, what really ignited it was the civil rights movement in the early 60s. And then there was a movement of women. There was a movement of students and so on and, on and so on and so on. Tremendous conflict. A lot of bombing. More bombing so far than than uh, in than in these days, a lot of killing, and it was arguably the period of greatest progress that we made in the second half of the 20th century. So I needed to come to terms with that, and with the gift from this artist of the forge metaphor, I could begin to wrap my mind around it. That is, you can make things hot and malleable in a society, and that can hurt. I mean, I'll bet if you interviewed the metal, the metal would say, ouch, we don't like this at all, right? So it can hurt. And at the same time, that malleability can be used for change. And that's why in the 1930s we could get so much change. That's why the Nordics could do as well. Now, another thing that, that makes it like, like a forge is that the forge doesn't care what the outcome is. So it's happy if blacksmiths are making horseshoes, right? It's happy if my friend is making gorgeous art. It would be fine with the forge if I was working a forge, I would make junk because I have no idea what I'm doing. Right? So I would make junk. Forge would happily make, make, uh, make the metal available for me because a forge has no opinion about whether it should go uh, in what we call a negative way or, or go in a positive way or both at the same time. So in Germany, at the very same time as the Nordics were doing their amazing leap forward, Germany was leaping to the Nazis and Hitler, right? And in Italy, at the very same time, the forge was at work, tremendous polarization in Italy, and they were going to the fascists and Mussolini's dictatorship. Forge doesn't care. All the forge does is heat up institutions, get people moving, moving, moving. What we could count on five years ago, we can no longer count on. I've run into Americans on this book tour who tell me they're not sure there's going to be another free election, free national election in this country. Wow, that was an institution I thought was in stone. But it turns out it's metal that can be heated by a forge. Right? Norms melt during polarization. You've noticed melting norms, January 6th being only one example. So that's what happens when a forge is at work. Opportunity and the decision about what will be the outcome is our decision. What we do with these malleable institutions. What we do with the melted norms. That, to tell you the truth, now I'll relate this to my age. I'm 85. That was hugely consequential for me to realize. That I was born in the 30s, great decade for progress. I lived and very, was very active in the 60s, great decade for progress. And I'm still around <laughs> in our next big decade for progress, maybe two decades. I don't know. The forge doesn't let us know how long it's going to keep eating. But I'm here with you to make the most of the polarization that exists and will grow. I get to join you in making the most of it, in making the big changes that weren't available before. We wanted, for example, Medicare for all. We've wanted that for a long time. A majority of Americans, according to the polls, have wanted Medicare for all. Haven't been able to get it, right? Well, forge keeps pumping, polarization keeps growing, we'll be able to get Medicare for all. I'm serious. We can. 
Now, how to do it? Well, obviously the, Germans, the German left didn't know how to use their opportunity, nor did the Italian left know how to. But their right wings knew how to use their opportunity and got, to, got uh, fascist and uh, Nazi outcomes, right? So the question gets to be, who knows how to use their opportunity? The Nordics knew how to use their opportunity. That's one reason why I was so cheerful about writing that book. They really knew how to use that opportunity. They used it extremely well and got the greatest progress that any country has made in, in the world. And we had enough wise people in the 1930s, we in the, this country, and in the 1960s, 70s, so that we could make forward progress. Despite the assassinations, despite the killing, despite all that mess, we made the progress that we needed to make in the 1930s and 60s. So let's do that again. Or even, let's copy the Nordics and do more than we were able to do in the 30s and 60s. Let's move further ahead, and, we, and actually we better do that given the predictions for climate disaster, right? We may have a bigger amount that we need to change than we needed to change in the 30s and 60s. Well, then let's go ahead and do that. And I get to be part of it. Am I a lucky guy or what? So, okay, this may be a tough book tour, but I promise not to die on it. <laughs> because I'm so tickled to be around with y'all to make the biggest change that we can make. I have six great-grandchildren. The stakes are high for me. I want them to have a future that's a more, a more positive future than, than I actually had when I was born. That's possible. The question is, will we wake up, do the right things in movement building, adopt the right strategies, be courageous enough to make the great gains that we can make? And that's why I wrote my book, How We Win. We have some copies of that over, over uh, somewhere or other stacked. So that's, that's what I want to uh, provoke you with, a very different perspective on polarization from the one that is usually present. Now, I don't want to minimize the hurt. I referred to it earlier. The metal probably doesn't like being heated. My family can tell you, they walk into the uh, br uh, uh, breakfast table, the kitchen in the morning. Sometimes they find me reading the newspaper, eating my granola, and crying at the same time. My heart is very alive to the amount of hurt, the increased, uh, in the increased violence that happens, the, the breaking apart of relationships that happens in polarization, the fights over nothing <laughs> that happens during polarization. It hurts my heart that that happens. So I think it's very important for me, as, a, as, as somebody concerned about my own mental health and responsible for that, that I let go of the hurt as I'm perceiving the bad news so that I'm free to make the changes that need to be made. So there is a challenge there. There's a challenge of dancing with history that uh, kind of ups our, you know, ups our dancing skill. <laughs> to both acknowledge how distressing this time can be, and at the same time, to get more crafty and more courageous and make bigger changes than we've made before in our lives. That's the opportunity now. And now you can see why I'm so excited. You may also think I'm totally nuts, but anyway, <laughs> that's why I think I'm excited. Now, how about you get a chance to turn to your neighbors and to have a, a minute to, uh, to talk about what are challenges that you'd like to make to this perspective that I'm sharing and uh, questions that you have. It's okay also to just plain have questions uh, because I'm very happy to respond both uh, informationally to your questions, perspective, so on, and also happy to receive your challenges because I realize the point of view that I put out is pretty unique and, uh, and, and has plenty of room for challenge. So how about turning to each other? Wherever you are, turn your backs and you know, find each other. And uh, in twos and threes and fours, uh, try to figure out some really good challenges and some really good questions you've got for me.
Well, I'm not a mind reader, so someone will need to raise a hand. <laughs> there we go. Well, I'm concerned that some of the examples you gave have, uh, have sort of backslid, like some of the Nordic countries are kind of reneging on some of their social progress issues. And that raised the issue for me about how we imagine the time scale of our work. I've always imagined myself trying to change the future of American history, you know, by being a political activist. And the thought occurred to me, what if I imagined that my task was to make the next five years or the next 10 years better for everybody and let go of the far future? then that would kind of allow for some ups and downs and some backslidings. And it wouldn't mean that I had failed. It would just mean that the unit of taking care of society, society is more like a garden than a statue, and that our task is to garden this era. So I'm wondering what you think about that as a way of uh, approaching our engagement with these big issues and the reverses that happen. I, th I think it's okay as a as a kind of metaphor, a way of thinking about about things. Um, historically, I think what tends to happen is that we can improve and improve to the point where we can face another challenge, and the challenge can throw us back for a bit, while uh, you know while we're working on it. So that's what happened to the, the Nordics. The Nordics improved, improved, improved so hugely that a lot of people wanted to move there instead of them wanting to move to, to another country. A lot of people wanted to move there, right? Especially lots of people from the Middle East came in as immigrants and so on. Uh, Sweden was, for example, the most generous uh, country, although Germany ran them a close second in terms of opening the gates and letting people stream into Germany. Well, immigration is always a problem for a country um, because it raises worry on the part of the people who already live there. You know, how is this going to change things? Uh, not everybody welcomes change automatically. A lot of people, oh, gosh, our country's changing. What, what's, what's this going to mean, right? And so, uh, and that happened most of all in Sweden of the Nordic countries because they took in the most. It was a heroic, a heroic amount. Um, the, the leadership of Sweden that agreed to do that knew perfectly well that they were making trouble for themselves by opening the gates so wide. Also, I think An Angela Merkel knew the same in Germany because th of the large countries, she was the one who took in the most, knowing she was making trouble for herself. So each, each government in that case uh, needed to figure out how much trouble is too much trouble, <laughs> how wide the gates to open, right? So they both, I think, are going to get through this, uh, but it does create trouble. And so then they have to figure out how to handle the, the, what, what existentially arises from a very generous approach uh, of, of, you know, a very, very generous approach to, to uh, inviting the problems that come along with it. And so then they get to tackle that, which is what they're doing. They're tackling that. The, the Nordic countries watch each other's policies with regard to immigration. So Sweden recently said, whoops, the settlement policy that we've been using for immigrants is wrong compared with the Norwegian one. The Norwegian approach is way more sensible, so now we will adopt the Norwegian one. So that's a, a, an approach I like because it's a problem-solving approach. And in my life, what works best is to expect problems and then to try to solve them, <laughs> rather than to expect utopia and a period when I'll just be able to, you know, coast. So I like countries that operate the way that I do. I have to admit, it's pretty egocentric of me. But my guess is if, if you're successful in your life, that's what you do too. You understand that. Uh, that taking initiatives will bring also new problems into your life, and then you get to solve those, or not. And that's how things go. Yeah. Um, thanks very much for being here. Thank you for your life's work. Thank you for the joy, the sense of joy that you obviously bring to all of your work, and, and we need that. Um, my question is about what Dennis here called the continuity of engagement. I'm a lifelong organizer, and I think 
gosh, I wonder what happened to some of those Swarthmore students. Did they go to law school? Did they disappear into corporate America or liberal lawyers and disengage? Because most of my life I've worked with college students who are, or maybe right out of college, who spend a year or two working on the death penalty or whatever I was involved with, and then go, and then sort of disappear. And here in Eugene, we have had, uh, when, when Trump came to town, I mean, got, got elected, there was a massive movement of protest. And I was among the groups organizing around that, and people got frustrated after a year or two and fell off and have sort of not, no longer being engaged. And I, we see that with the Extinction Rebellion movement and other climate movements and Sunrise here in Eugene. So what, I'm sure you've thought a lot about that, the continuity of engagement. Thank you for that phrase. What is your suggestion on keeping people in for the long haul despite the evidence? Now you know why I wrote this one. <laughs> because I'd already published Viking Economics, which showed how brilliant those movements were, and we, and they don't mind being copied at all. We could do that anytime we want. And then I wrote How We Win, which is a kind of handbook for how to create winning campaigns that could transform this country. And then I thought, exactly as you did, yeah, but what about the resilience question? That's how I heard your question. Which, where's the resilience of the students? You know, they may come, but then do. Uh, can they can they roll with the results and can they roll with the unfolding of their lives and stay with it, right? Uh, a bunch of my students, so that's why I wrote this because this is a story of resilience. Um, but And everybody would have their own story of resilience in here who is still, still at it. In the case of the students, uh, it became clear to me that they needed, uh, they needed those uh, opportunities to work on their resilience, which meant don't take one course and then Aha! And then hope that that will do it. They need another course in which they can get more perspective. And then another course, another course. One student came to Swarthmore from Texas, all the way from Texas, because he knew Swarthmore would be a great springboard for a life as a physicist. Physics was his great love for, in high school. So he comes to Swarthmore, and along with his uh, you know, physics, he takes a course with me. Next semester, oh. He takes another course with me because I kept inventing new courses. Oh, hi, Jane. Yeah, well, I wanted to see what this was about. And then in the third semester, Zane, what are you doing here? Well, this is a different course from the first two. I wanted to see what that's like. He ended up giving up his physics major, <laughs> became a peace and conflict studies major. He took every course that I taught and, and a, a few others besides, and is now the director of Training for Change, an institution that I had organized and run for 15 years. He's now the director of Training for Change, and he's in it for life, and he entirely blames me. <laughs> but actually, I would, I would say it's because he found the possibility of resilience, the chance to reflect on isn't that what a lot of resilience amounts to? The chance to not only make the changes, but reflect on those changes and absorb them into a bigger and bigger picture of what is possible for ourselves. And that's what, uh, that's what uh, most students don't have a chance to get because they have whatever, they have their career aspirations. And in general, those students who are still uh, running Sunrise Movement, which is still expanding and still learning more about how to be powerful, uh, those, those were students who did the same thing that that physici physics major did, and they're, they're uh, running Sunrise Movement. And that's, uh, what, 10 years? That I guess I was teaching them 10 years ago, something like that, 10, 12 years ago. So, uh, of course, I mean, dropping out does happen. Life, life uh, isn't the same for everyone, but uh, yeah. And, and they, also, they also were being taught by somebody who was a living example of resilience, right? So, and I was always very honest with my students, and my students really knew you know, what made me tick. And I think that was, that was a help, especially on the second course, the third course, or you know, the, as they got to know me better, I was able to mentor, which is, and, and that's because I had been so well mentored when I was their age. <laughs> And so I was just trying to pass along this gift of mentorship, which a lot of us could could do. But it does mean uh, being uh, really love. It means loving the students. 
It really means loving your students. When I was teaching at the University of Pennsylvania, one of my f colleagues caught me out and was furious and met me at the coffee machine and said, I don't love my students. He felt so defensive about the fact that I loved my students. Of course I love my students. Well, I mean, I, I try to love my enemy, but at least I can love my students. <laughs> yes? I think this question uh, is inspired by Mike here, but I'm interested in the idea of polarization being a peaceful thing rather than like a fighting. Oh, it's a fighting thing. It's a fighting thing. So I'm interested in the idea of effective polarization versus diversity of ideas and the kind of polarization that's yin and yang and just natural things that's not fighting. And wondering if we could have more of this this uh, healthy kind of polarization and less of the fighting polarization. No, I, I'm afraid I, that doesn't work for me. My understanding is that polarization is terrible and wonderful at the very same time. So it has these negative impacts on us, like you know, relationships severed and people not talking to each other and a, a, a decision if you're American, you have a right to not pay attention to facts. <laughs> <laughs> and stuff like that. Uh, the, what polarization is especially good at is um, making a big m mountain out of a molehill of a difference, right? So if you don't say, if you don't uh, address a, a group different from yours in exactly the correct way, there's the outrage, right, and stuff like that. So among movements, within movements, people can be cursing each other out. Oh, you're terrible, you're not, you know, you're sexist, you're racist, you're this, you're that. And uh, because polarization goes on within organizations as well. Polarization goes on within Quaker meetings. It just go. It, it's polarization is heating us all up. That's what it's doing. So you can, I was, thinking that's a really negative thing. I don't like it. I'm not a comfortable piece of metal. <laughs> Probably metal isn't comfortable either. So forget about comfort. Okay, we're done with comfort. It's a polarized period. And so what we can get out of it is the opportunity to change things. That's what we can get out. That's what it offers. Yeah. Yes? Just to kind of follow up with that, there are some you know, communities that are going to be harder hit by polarization than others. Like some of us have a certain amount of privilege that protects us from the consequences of polarization, whereas other communities you know, are going to take the brunt of the death, the violence, the disease, the poverty that comes along with polarization. And I'm just kind of wondering how that squares you know, with, like, is, is it worth it? guess is what I'm asking. Like, how do, you, how do you count the cost of it? Oh, no. Rich people get polarized, too. Well, right, but they don't face the consequences of that polarization. Well, they might be thrown out of the family. They might lose the, uh, you know, lose the, the, the dad won't will the fortune to the son because the son has gone to the left, and uh, the dad doesn't want the son to have millions of dollars at their disposal to fund left organizations. No, polarization, polarization is uh, non-discriminatory. It, it, uh, it definitely goes after the rich. It goes after everybody. So our, our ruling class, our economic elite, will have more and more splits in it because polarization does that. It, it, uh, it reduces unity. Yeah. In the, in the 1930s, for example, there were members of the ruling class of the, uh, the economic elite who were so upset with Franklin Delano Roosevelt, they talked with military high-ranked military people about, isn't it time for a coup? Isn't it time to replace the president with you know, a dictator because the country's going, going crazy? But I want to assure you that was not a popular view <laughs> within the economic elite, which thought that they could, they could handle, you know, they could manage FDR if he would only stop listening to his wife. You know, and so, <laughs> and so on. That they could ride through it, which they did ride through it, uh, thanks partly to World War II. They, that that was a help for them. Um, so yeah, yeah, no, no. Polarization affects everybody. It's it is, uh, and you can have a non polar. You can have um, a non polarized period. Let's say 1950s, 1950s in our country, very non polarized, in which there was tremendous poverty, tremendous racism 
tremendous suffering, right? Almost nobody talked about it, but it was all there. Horrible, horrible times for many, many people. So, yeah, it's, it's really, if the, uh, the closest that I can come to understanding a, a na nailing down a causal uh, force for polarization is economic inequality. It seems that the more a, a society uh, develops economic inequality, the more polarization shows up on all, on all fronts. And so it is certainly true, as you say, or imply, that there is more and more economic inequality in our country. And that's built in. They're building that, that in structurally all the time. And so we're going to have more and more polarization. But the polarization is an equal opportunity uh, force. It, it heats up uh, all, all the classes. Yeah. Another one. Yes. So with the talk of polarization sort of stimulated some thoughts in me, and I'm just wondering how you would respond. Uh, you know, John Stuart Mill and On Liberty emphasized the importance of a collision of adverse opinions. Uh, because no one person has the whole truth and you need to move forward uh, in this. But, and then there's a fellow named Ed Catmull who wrote a book called Creativity Incorporated. He was a CEO of Pixar. And how do you bring out the sort of creativity that's needed to make one of these, these films that Pixar makes? Because every one of these films, he says, started out in the ugly baby phase had serious problems with the plot or the character, or this or that. And so their solution ultimately was, you give kind of free reign to the people who are making a particular film until they get to a certain stage, and then they go before a, a brain trust of other people who have made films. And when they do that, Capmo finds you really need candor. Even though maybe you're friends with the other people or that, you really need to speak the truth because you need to, you know, become aware of what the problems are they need working on. And, and then you give, you know, it's the people who are making the film to, once they hear uh, about these problems, become more aware of them. It's, it's up to them to figure out a solution. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, you know, the way you're thinking positive things can come out of polarization, I don't know uh, if it, it kind of relates to this idea of maybe of more knowledge or more creativity um, when people are aware, maybe, oh, I don't have the whole truth. Uh, oh, I need to take into, the, take into account this other way of looking at things. It's certainly true that creativity is promoted by, by conflict. And and that's and creativity is highly valued for any society that's really moving forward, right? So uh, so institutions will will create uh, uh, ways of waging conflict that support the creativity and keep the people in the room fighting with each other, right? Writers' rooms and TV shows or whatever, ah, yeah, and then they go out and drink after it together, whatever. Yeah. So it, this is definitely not. Um, polarization is different from the conflict that we're used to and that all societies that are at all, at all creative ha uh, are handle. Lots and lots of conflict can be handled. Um, in fact, uh, groups that decide not to have conflict get uh, die, actually. They die. They disintegrate. They die. Uh, just lose their creativity, lose their attractiveness. I know churches that have decided conflict is bad, and then uh, and and Quaker meetings that decided conflict is bad, and they they uh, get smaller and smaller every year. So conflict is enormously a uh, benefit. Polarization is different in that it's making difference, making a big deal out of difference. You know what I mean? So you're not combing your hair right, <laughs> you know? or you're not expressing your your different opinion correctly because you didn't refer to whatever, 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 or you didn't acknowledge whatever, whatever, right? I didn't do a land acknowledgement here, you know. So, so you know, with polarizations really moving in this group, then a couple of you will have walked out by now, right? So, but that's not actually the creative conflict that you're talking about. That's something different, yeah. So it's a kind of exaggerated conflict 
that really, uh, instead of say, acknowledging your point of view may be correct, it's more like, you are bad. And that's why I can shut you out. Or in some situations, that's why I can be violent against you. you know, or cut off your access to this or that or the other thing that you need. Yeah, so polarization's mean. <laughs> and at the same time, I know this is very hard to make, make sense with. I mean, I worked for years to try to make sense of this. Uh, so, so, yeah, polarization brings meanness. And at the same time, hope. Because you can change more when people are being <laughs> mean. <laughs> <laughs> than you can when people are being, oh, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting point of view. Yeah, well, let's consider that an interesting point of view. It, it, no, no, no. So, so it, it, it really calls on spiritual strength for us. And one of the reasons why in How We Win, in that book, which is now for sale um, here, uh, I really emphasize the importance of forming uh, a tolerance for healthy conflict, even a desire for healthy conflict in movement groups is so that movement groups will be able to be, be inventive, be creative, and at the same time um, uh, keep, keep reassuring each other, and we're in this together, we're in this together. So it's, it's very much easier. I know I'm not describing it as clearly as I would like to, but it's, um, it's, it's finding a kind of... Uh, recipe that really flavors the whole thing uh, b because of, of social bonds that can be built. Uh, it, it flavors the whole thing in a positive way so that you can uh, move forward. And especially uh, move forward if, if you choose instruments for moving forward, like campaigns, di direct action campaigns. Another question, yes? We're concerned that um, if you were to close your eyes and look at the polarization in, um, in the, at least in the U.S., mm -hmm. you would actually um, feel a, a much higher octane on the right than on the left. And so my question is, when I think about the 60s and I think where was the high octane, um, it was in the force of change. So um, and. Uh, so I'm actually wondering whether you want to speak to that a little bit. Does, does that metaphor make sense? Yeah, this is great. This is great. Great question. Great question. So this I don't have empirical data on yet, and I really wish I did. Here's my hypothesis. We'll have to do more research on this. My hypothesis is that people on the left pay tons of attention to people on the right and exaggerate their power. And people on the right pay tons of attention to the people on the left and exaggerate our power. So people on the right, for example, over and over and over talk in terms of defense of their values. Defending freedom, for example. Defending freedom of, of speech against the woke people who will take our freedom of speech away and force us to use particular formulae in order to talk. Hate it, right? Freedom of families to be able to decide how their children should re be reared in relation to sexuality because the schools are taking that away and forcing them to, to read LGBTQ books. And I mean, if you look at the right carefully, almost every point they make is loss of freedom, defense for freedom. That's what they love. Well, I love freedom too. Right? But they, they see the left as attacking freedom. Um, and, and, and it makes them furious. And a lot of their proposals for change are to, are to you know, fend, fend themselves right? from this terrible contamination from the left. The woke people who are attacking us. Our good country are, is being taken over by the left. Do you understand? So they are very furious, and that's where their anger comes from. And that's why they can be violent against us, because it, it is a matter of defending this country and its history. Okay. And then on the left, the same thing. You know, we're constantly focusing on they don't pay attention to facts, and they don't read, wear masks, and they don't do this, and they don't do that. So my guess is that we both inflate the other's power and feel defensive on behalf of that, 
and and feel over, overwhelmed or feel, uh, you know, oh my God, oh my God, they're going to get us. And that prevent that gets in the way emotionally of our objective look at what polarization does, which is provides an opportunity for us to make huge gains. Um, now, uh, one one place where I want to return to history, I've done some historical research on Germany in, in their move toward Nazism, and I want to return to that to see whether that was going on there too. But it's very clear that the German left made all kinds of mistakes by exaggerating the power of the right and all, and and in their own defense, attacking the right more and more Viciously. So one of the things that, that happened in the left-right Germany thing that I already know about is that um, they found out each other's drinking spots, favorite drinking spots. <laughs> so the, the right or the left, whichever got around to it first, however inebriated they, you need to get to do this, would go to the, the, the tavern frequented by the other side, you know, and bait them from outside, right? So the people inside from the other side would come out and fight them on the street, and then there'd be a big street fight. Then, of course, the next night, there had to be a retaliation. You know, so if it was the right attacking the left, then the left would have to attack the, right, the tavern where the right people, <laughs> right-wing people were. And so that kind of thing just went on more and more and more. So the center, there's always in this right-left thing, there's always a center, right? The uncommitted or not sure people that are kind of watching both sides. They're getting more and more apprehensive in Germany because there's a breakdown in law and order more and more violence in the streets. And Germans tend to be, I think, even more worried about that than Americans are. And so they got more and more worried and said, we need to, we need to have order again. This, this is way too much violence going on uh, between the left and the right. And so they, the center, um, uh, which is, it tends to be con controlled I would say, by the economic elite of any country. Um, certainly, uh, not, ever, not all countries, but certainly Germany, the economic elite was for running things. Uh, set, uh, with this support, the political support of the center said, right, we need to get rid of uh, this attack on law and order. We need to restore order. Who could restore order for us? Right, Hitler could do that. So when the crucial parliamentary vote came, it was the economic elites party, the conservative party, that, that swung, the, swung the thing so that the parliament put Hitler in as prime minister and the rest is history. So, well, we can learn from that. So however provocative the right gets, and it will always get, appear to be big, bigger than it really is, um, we need to remain steadfastly nonviolent and not be baited. Now, one of the things that gets us to be violent, even if they, we don't tend to be violent, is fear, right? So this is the trouble. If we are indeed inflating the right as somehow in charge of the polarization process, which I don't think for a minute it is, but if we think the right is, is in charge and is attacking us and we are the ones in defense, then that is a great reason for some people to say, well, in defense, we have to, vi we have to defend ourselves vi violently, right? I mean, and every night on TV, we're told in America that violence is the way to get things done. <laughs> Right, all the cop shows and so on. It's always violence, right? So we're brought up from when we're little kids to think violence is the recourse. So whoa, what what a trap to walk into! So all we have to do is get scared enough, and we will pick up guns too, uh, or or use other means of violence, take them to our demonstrations, and so on, and so on, and so on. And then we get to have a breakdown of law and order, and then the economic elite in the United States gets to have a Hitler. Well, I don't really want that, that scenario to happen. So that's why it's so crucial. When, when we, I started this, um, this uh, amazing group that could take on the seventh largest bank in the country, the first thing we did was watch night after night after night in living rooms, civil rights movement uh, movies. Because if anybody in this country had a right to feel scared, it was black people in Alabama and black people in Mississippi. Because most white people wanted those black people dead. Right Now, I would doubt that in Eugene, there's a substantial number of people who want you dead. 
I mean, this bookstore wouldn't, ex wouldn't open if that were the case, right? But that is what the situation was for black people in, in Mississippi, Alabama. If anybody, scared as they were, uh, would have justification for picking up a gun to defend themselves in the civil, middle of the civil rights movement, it would be black people, right? The degree to which they were san sane and understood that would be the end for them. The degree to which they understood that nonviolence was the route to survival was extraordinary. So I would just say to any white person or any, any person in the North, black or white, look, if nonviolence was the way to stay, uh, increase your chance of staying alive in Mississippi and Alabama in, in that period, then nonviolence is the best way for you to stay alive right now. There is no excuse for you know the folks, and there is stuff, stuff you know going on on the left about well we we may have to do some strategic you know defensive violence in order to you know stay alive when the collisions happen. That is so wrong, so wrong, and such a misunderstanding of the nature of power. And it's but the thing is, in in so many countries that I've worked in, there's they don't have a civil rights movement history to learn from. And we are so blessed that we have a civil rights history to learn from. I would so recommend you watch civil rights movies. They're very available. They're, I list them in the How, How We Win, but you can find them on the internet. And watch them over and over and over because believe, I defy you to find a place in the North where the left is in anything like the danger that black movement people were in the Deep South. So we have valuable, valuable resources for handling polarization. So let's make the most of it. Another question. Yes, I should stop soon. Yeah. I, just, um, I love listening to you. It's just so inspiring. But the thing I worry about is um, this is a climate catastrophe. And you haven't really spoken to that. And I think that adds a real issue that we just don't have the time. That's anyway. That's in my negative right, part right. of my being. I just don't feel we have the time. Okay, so I have a, a contrary view of that as well. <laughs> I'm really getting to be contrary tonight. This is really fun. My family will be surprised because I tend to be. Uh, <laughs> harmonizer in my family. But anyway, so I get to be contrary on, on that. So uh, this is what I think about that. I think you're right that the climate catastrophe will create an ac acceleration and an intensification of what we're going through now. And it probably already is. Uh, and so, uh, because for one thing, it raises the fear level, right? Um, okay, so what we'll see, if the scientists are correct, and I have no reason to question that, um, is more and more climate disasters, actually disasters. Uh, I would like to think, living in the East, that it's mostly your problem, um, <laughs> but I don't think so. I think it's everywhere. I think it's everywhere. So, okay, more and more climate disasters. Now, what happens in a climate disaster? People look to government for security and safety and getting out of the situation, whether it's a flood or whatever, right? People look to government. It's a very reasonable thing to look to government for. It's, it's one of the reasons why government exists, is to help in emergencies, right? But the scale, if the scientists are right, of these climate emergencies, one after another after another, increasing tempo, and the sheer scale of them, looks to me like the government will fail over and over and over to adequately meet the needs for security of people. Now, government failing over and over about uh, failing to deliver on fundamental needs uh, leads to, according to political scientists, illegitimacy, loss of legitimacy. And when any government loses its legitimacy in the eyes of its people, it becomes open to revolution. Okay, that's plenty scary. The good news from the database is the number of, re of governments that have lost legitimacy 
And then there were nonviolent people's movements that overthrew the dictatorship, over, overthrew the government, even if the government was run by a dictator with an army to defend him, always him. It was the, um, it was the opportunity for masses of people using nonviolent struggle to overcome the, uh, the, the, the dictator and establish democracy. So that you'll find in the database. So, ironically, that might speed up the opportunity for dealing with it. Why? Why might that speed it up? Because the government is now, our government is and has been for as long as I know it, uh, a kind of front for the, iron, uh, for the economic elite. It's actually been controlled by the economic elite behind Behind, so. and and that's not unusual uh, to our country, right? Who was running Norway in the olden days? The economic elite. Well, how about Sweden? The economic elite. Well, how about Denmark? The economic elite. Funny how often the economic elite shows up running countries that are plausibly democratic, that appear to be democratic. It's an advantage for the economic elite to appear to be democratic, <laughs> obviously. Um, but that doesn't make it real or true. Okay, so uh, so we c I believe we can't make the changes that we need w on racial grounds, economic grounds, the various ways that, that we need changes, including you know free higher education. There are just so many things that the Nordics have that we could have, but we can't make those changes, and we certainly can't address the climate issue with the economically in control. Because the economic elite loves the profits that come from all that, right? We can't get rid of the military. We can't get rid of nuclear weapons as long as the economic elite is in control because they think it's just fine. It's scary for them sometimes. They will back off a little bit and allow a treaty to be made. But basically, they, you know, the military industrial complex is an enormous, enormous source of wealth for them. So we really, in order to meet the goals of, I'll bet, 90% of the people here, we need to take on the economic elite and do what the Nordics did, which was take away the power of the economic elite. And how we win <laughs> tells the answer. How to do it. Do you have time to go through all this? It's it's a step by step process. Okay, so so since it's a step by step process and it's actually complex, um, so I don't think I can do it right now. But um, let me at least tell the first big step. How how would that be? And then and then you can read how we win for the the steps after that. The first big step is to shift our organizing energy from one off opinion giving demonstrations of which we do a lot. We do a lot of that. You know, go out and get a sign and say, blah, 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 whatever we do about, about a current issue. To shift our organizing energy from that, which actually doesn't create any change. Dr. King acknowledged that toward the end of his life. He said, let's face it, protests don't change anything. What does? Campaigns. So let's take our organizer energy, which I love, and put it to organizing campaigns that make a difference. And then that's the first big step. So I read the example from here of the uh, of taking on the seventh largest bank in the country because that was a campaign run by a, initially a group smaller than this that took on the seventh largest bank in the country, we're talking about serious power, and forced it to do something against its will. And that is, in microcosm, what we need to do with the economic elite. We need to force a change that is against its will. We need to take over our own government and uh, say, sorry about that, but you're done. And so campaigns are the big first step. As soon as we get to be more adept at choosing targets that we can win, why is that important? Do Americans like winners or losers? If we want to build a mass movement, are masses of people attracted to losers or winners? Okay, so we need to win campaigns, and uh, then we will have masses of people 
because polarization takes care of that. Polarization generates masses of people who never have been in a demonstration in their lives who come forward. Black Lives Matter. People who never demonstrated in their lives demonstrated at that time because polarization was pushing them out. Unfortunately, Black Lives Matter didn't, didn't create a campaign that was going after a specific thing and push, push, push until it got it. It, it, it was a much more uh, diffuse thing, right? Black Lives Matter. Well, that's true, but uh, uh, any, any objective to change the culture is like way less tangible, right, than forcing a bank to do something it doesn't want to do or force it like that. So the things that re you can really identify as wins are campaigns, Montgomery bus boycott, the Birmingham struggle, the Selma struggle, and on and on and on, right? That's what got our country so aroused and uh, with, uh, ass uh, assisted by the polarization. And that's what we can do. So we can actually do all this because this is not rocket science. I'm so glad I'm not running around selling rocket science. I'm selling something that we can very, 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 very much do. And then what that will do, I believe, and I may be wrong, but I believe it will accelerate the process of getting the power away from the economic elite. And once we do that, then we can do the right thing by climate. But until we have the, the handle the economic, the economic elite is right now doubling down, right? There's more oil being drilled for now than was uh, five years ago. <laughs> the, the more consensus there is that there's a climate problem, the more excitement there is on the part of the economic elite to, to create it <laughs> to, and intensify it. It's exactly counterintuitive, uh, and it's exactly what they're doing. They are destroying the future of my great-grandchildren. They are doing that. So we have to get them. Okay, well, other countries have gotten them, gotten their economic elites. Let's us learn how to do that. And then when we do that, we can do the, uh, the deal with the climate thing. And the sooner we do the economic elite thing, the sooner we get the climate under control. So, uh, and polarization helps us because it accelerates the availability of mass movements. So if we do sharp campaigns that win. It's, they don't all have to win, but some have to win. Uh, that w it w they didn't all win in the South in the, the civil rights movement. Okay, you know, you went after your lunch counter, you went after your lunch counter. Oh, you won with your lunch counter. Oh, you lost. Okay, but still, you're part of a movement. Yay, so you try something else like that. So that's the way it multiplies, 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 and uh, that's, that's how we can accelerate the chance to take on climate. And that's going to be so exciting because there are so many young people in our country today who are on the verge of real disrespect for older people for having dumped this terrible climate situation on them. And we can redeem ourselves by taking leadership, white hairs especially, yay. We can take leadership in tackling the uh, economic elite through campaigns and show we can be courageous. Last thing I'll say, I keep, keep wanting to end this because I want to sign books, but the uh, last thing I'll say, I learned the biggest lesson about courage from a Quaker lion tamer <laughs> who picked me up when I was book touring through Holland, and he was the curator of a museum at that time, but he said his career, before he retired and took this retirement job, his career was working in circuses with lions and tigers. I said, whoa, I've never met a lion tamer before. You know, here I am in this car. We're driving to his place, and I'm sitting in the front seat with a lion tamer. I Wouldn't any of you want to be sitting in the front seat with a lion tamer? Oh, my gosh. I said, well, uh, you know, tell me more about what that life is like. He said, I'll show you my scrapbook. So we get to his living room. He pulls out his scrapbook very proudly. And I'm looking at these photos. Well, of course, we come to the classic photo. You've all seen a photo of somebody with their head in the mouth of an open lion, right? That's a classic photo. So well, he had one. And that was his head. It's <laughs> and I turn to him, and I say, you are the bravest person I have ever met. And he said, wish I could claim it. And I said, why? I mean, look at this photo. He said, 
The problem for me is that I love my cats. I love my lions. I love my tigers. When I was a boy, I was crazy about tabbies, cute little kittens. These are just big old grown-up kittens to me. I love them. They love me. So I don't get scared. He said, because, George, courage is what you do when you're scared and do it anyway. That's what courage is. So I don't get to be courageous with my cats because I'm not scared. I just do it for fun. So he said, what I have to do is choose areas that scare me. And then when I do it anyway, my courage grows. And my image of myself as a fully realized person is a person who, in, among other things, is courageous. I want to be courageous, says he. So that's my life journey. I find thing after thing that scares me. It might be speaking up in a particular assembly, or it might be, you know, whatever it is, different things for different folks, right? But I take on something that scares me, and I do it anyway, and then I grow in courage. Thank you, said I. This entire book tour was worth it for this conversation. I didn't understand courage in the correct way. And so a beautiful thing about this movement, which is a saving movement for our grandchildren, is also it will uh, invite you to courage, development of your own courage, because you will be setting up things you do that are scary, like going to jail or whatever. I don't know, you know, different people, different things. But you will get to, you will get to get scared. And then you will get to do the thing anyway, even though you're scared, and your courage will grow. And next time I come back here, you'll all walk in here like, uh, I don't know what, you ought to be wearing briefs or something. <laughs> you walk in here like lion tamers. <laughs> I'm eager to sign books, and I don't even know where we sign books here. Do I sit here? Right here. That's awesome. So I've been working hard. Now you get to work hard by buying books. And this has been a tremendous pleasure for me. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>